welcome everybody. Uh, thank you all for joining us for the 13th yeah. Image Awards. Yep. And um, and also thank you for coming back after what feels like a very long time of having these these wonderful large format events where we get to come together and, and talk about our science. Um, this, as you know, is a highlight of our event calendar. So thank you all for joining us. Um, and I really want to take a, a very few short moments to thank everybody who's made this event really possible. Um, the scientists who contributed their amazing images, um, the, um, the administration staff who pulled this um, event together and make all of this happen. And I especially want to call out a very special thank you to Erica Reinfeld. Erica, this is her baby. Um, she has carried the Image Awards for the past 10 years. And it's actually with great sadness that I, I get to tell you all that this is actually Erica's last event. Um, she's going to be moving across campus, joining the uh, Department of, uh, of Nuclear Science. So in honor of Erica's love of puns, I am going to tell you all that Erica has gone nuclear. So, um, so with my one and only pun of the evening, I am going to hand this over to Erica. And again, thank you all for being here. And I look forward to chatting with you all after the event. Thank you so much, Jane. And thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, pardon me while I pull up our wonderful presentations by our speakers. Um, where's that? Whoops. And here we go. We have. Here we go. All right. So welcome. As Jane said, this is the thirteenth thirteenth uh, annual Image Awards. And we are so excited to be here and we hope you will also uh, join the conversation on Twitter. We have a hashtag, we'll be keeping an eye on things uh, for this. So. Of course it worked perfectly when we practiced. So this event of course could not be possible without our sponsors. Um, so we are very grateful. Uh, Emit Imaging, Fujifilm Visual Sonic, Nikon Zeiss, uh, many of them are here and will be uh, at the reception afterwards. So please thank them when you can. We are delighted um, to have such support for such an amazing program, our Image Awards competition and opening event. So thank you all very much. Uh, we also would not have an exhibition if it were not for our judges, some of whom are also here. Um, we have an amazing panel of judges with expertise in both science and art. Uh, and we encourage them to choose out of this year, I think we had 175 entries, uh, and these were the 10 images chosen, both for the beauty, the visual beauty of the image, as well as the science story. So thank you to the judges who made these very difficult decisions. Uh, we are so appreciative. Um, and also thanks to Fujifilm, we have an opportunity for those of you in the audience um, to play a little role of judges. Of course, I love all the images equally, and everyone is a is an absolute winner here, but we have uh, some cameras to give away to uh, the people's choice. The audience today uh, can vote for the story and the science uh, and the presentation and image that you find most compelling and most engaging. So we encourage you, we'll put this uh, URL up at the end as well. Um, but this is, this is a, a new thing and thank you to Fujifilm for donating the prizes for this. All right, and so with that, um, in the spirit of reality competition, um, we're going to turn things over to Dancing with the Cells. Okay, can you hear me okay? Oh, thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Erika, and thank you to all of you for being here today. My name is Teemu Miettinen, and I work in the laboratory of Scott Manolis right here in the Koch Institute. In our lab, we study cell division from a physical perspective. We want to understand how cells regulate their mass and their stiffness, and in this case, the movement of their plasma membrane. What you can see here in this image are two cervical cancer cells that have just divided from each other, but they are still connected by a narrow bridge. <clears throat> the plasma membrane, which is the outermost layer of a cell, is a highly fluid structure that moves around the cell like the arms of a dancer as the cell divides. And here in this image, you can see the plasma membrane in red and yellow. 
in blue, you can see the DNA of a cell. So that would be all the contents that tell the cell what it is, and what to do. In a normal cell division, the DNA is segregated evenly between the two daughter cells. However, sometimes cell divisions fail and the DNA doesn't segregate evenly. This means that mutations arise. Such mutations can cause cancer or sometimes just cells die. But to help you understand what this really look like, let's zoom in to the cell division on the right hand side. Here you can see two cells that have just separated from each other, but a narrow strand of DNA can still be seen running between the cell in a very thin bridge that connects the cells. Such lacking strands of DNA will eventually have to be cut in order for the cell division to complete. Now, consequently, one of the daughter cells is gonna get excess DNA that the other one is missing. Both of the daughter cells become mutants. Both can behave abnormally. Now, in a normal human body, there will be more than a quadrillion cell divisions in a lifetime more if you're unlucky with cancer. Now, <clears throat> that number is huge. It's more than stars in our galaxy, okay? It's way more than I can really imagine. It's 10 million billion cell divisions that your body will undergo. Now, most of your body's biomass, is, it's, it's in your muscles, it's in our adipose tissue, but most of cell divisions are not actually for those cells. Most of the cell divisions in our body are taking place to form the very small and short-lived cells of our blood. So the white and red blood cells. These cells, due to their small size and their short lifespan typically, are made in billions every single day. And if we look at cell divisions in cancer cells that originate from your blood cells, such as leukemias, we see cell divisions that look very different. So these leukemia cells are pulling their plasma membrane to the side of cell division as their two daughter cells separate. So that by the end of cell division, the space between the two cells has this excess accumulation of plasma membrane that we do not see in most other cell types. And if we image these cells with even more resolution using an electron microscope, we can even see how the plasma membrane is folding around the bridge that connects the two daughter cells. Different cell types, vastly different looking cell divisions. Now, we believe that understanding these physical differences between cell types will one day enable us to actually prevent cell divisions in a specific cell type, such as these leukemia cells. But to do that, we have to first understand how cell divisions look like, and we have to understand how different cell types achieve different looking cell divisions. In our case specifically, this means that we want to understand the molecular mechanisms that are pulling the plasma membrane to the division side in the leukemia cells. And once you understand those mechanisms, you can start to perturb them, not only to understand cancer, but potentially to treat cancer in diseases like leukemias. This is how basic cell biology lays the foundations for cancer research. And this is why even here in a cancer research institute, we have to understand cell biology. So with that, I just wanna acknowledge that this work would not be possible without great supervision by Professor Scott Manalis, our wonderful collaborators, and very importantly, also our generous funders who understand that we have to sometimes look at the very basics of biology before we can do cancer research. Thank you for your time. Thank you, and we did promise this was an award ceremony, so congratulations. Thank you. All right. Thank you so very much for sh sharing the vision for this project. All right, it's gonna be a long night, everyone. Um, but on this, on the theme of, of cells gone wrong, we're going to invite up another aspect of cell biology and a another branch of biology uh, as uh, Junsik comes forward to de deliver to us some grains of truth. Okay, can you hear me? All right, thanks. 
thanks uh, for the introduction, Erica. My name is Jun Sik, like RNA Sik, Jun Sik, uh, and Che. Uh, and the High Tech Institute is actually across the street. Um, so today, I'm going to start with a generalized question first. So I'm studying plant biology, and you might ask, like, why do people study plant biology, right? Why do people study plants? First, they're actually very pretty, right? Second, they can be source of our daily products when we can be money, right? But for many plant biologists like myself, plants themselves are a great platform to unravel the mystery of organism and life. So the question now is like, which plant do I study? So let me put it in this way. When you wanna have a pet, you don't really choose a giraffe, right? But you end up with usually a dog or even a cat or even a smaller one like a hamster. So this is quite similar to plant biologists in the reality. Not every plant biologist can study giant trees, nor they want to do that. So they can still study plants by choosing a smaller organism, such as Arabidopsis baliana, that I'm going to tell you. So here is the Arabidopsis baliana. They can grow up to like a one foot tall. So it's easy to handle and easy to grow in a lab condition like this. There are many different subfields of the plant biology and I, specific, I specifically study plant cells in Arabidopsis baliana. So let's go look into a cell. So the previous speaker already talked about cells. This is a cell, I mean, it's generalized diagram uh, can be from like animal or either plant. And you already see there are many different subjects you can study even in a single cell. So I have to specifically choose which one to study further uh, inside this cell. And I chose an organelle called nucleus, which contains genetic information called DNA. So again, we're going into a nucleus. And again, there are too many components you can study for your whole life. So today I'm gonna to introduce one important structure, which is called nuclear lamina under here. So what is nuclear lamina and why is it important? Why do I study that? So first, the nuclear lamina as a definition is a meshwork protein structure under the inner nuclear membrane. So you see that it's like a meshwork structure under this inner nuclear membrane. And because it plasters the inner nuclear membrane, it is in close proximity to genetic information or DNA and also other protein components. The other thing is that the nuclear, uh, the nuclear lamina uh, affects how cellular materials are going in and out of nucleus by interacting with a structure called nuclear pore complex. All right. The most important of the most important part of the nuclear lamina that I'm going to tell you is that if the organism have a nuclear lamina defects, then the organism will actually suffer genetic disease uh, and abnormal development. So in plant biology that I'm studying, there are many different futures of development or futures of the nuclear lamina. And then one thing that I found is that they are very important in plant reproduction. So you are looking at here a Arabidopsis pollen. So this is a single pollen and in a healthy, normal Arabidopsis plant, you can see this sleek pollen, but you have a defects in the nuclear lamina structure, then the pollen actually become oddly shaped in the mutant. The nuclear lamina itself is a small, tiny structure in a single nucleus in the cell, but the failure of having this structure will result into a butterfly effect ranging from this reduced fertility to the complete death of the organism. So my main question, uh, so by studying that, I'm sorry, this is because the mutated nuclear lamina cannot regulate genetic uh, information properly and the nuclear function too. So by studying the plant nuclear lamina, I can illuminate the mechanism, how the plant nuclei regulate the plant genetic information and plant genetic disease and overall plant development. Uh, with that, I really appreciate uh, Nanotechnology Materials Core facility. They really pushed me to submit this image. Without their help, I couldn't uh, get selected here. I really appreciate Abigail and David for taking these images. And of course, this whole project 
couldn't be progress with my great mentor uh, in the Whitehead Institute, Mary Guerin. Uh, thanks for listening. Thank you so much. I'm starting to think this was perhaps just trying to send us all subliminal messages that we all want at giraffes. Yeah, don't worry all, it's going to get much more appalling from here. All right, so what I wanna do is move out from the center of cells and look at cells all together. And in this case, in our next image, uh, we're going to be looking at cells through time. Um, so I'm gonna invite Jackie up to come and show us uh, through tail as old as time, some beauty in a beast. <laughs> Can you all hear me okay? Thanks. Okay, and thank you for the introduction and um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to share my image with everyone tonight. Um, okay, um, so are eggs, sperm, and the cells that produce them. During fertilization, the egg and the sperm will meet as such. The, this cell will go through several stages of division and development, eventually producing a child um, of arguably pretty cute stage of development. Um, and that child will, of course, grow into an adult. And adults are, I would say, of very cuteness stages of development. <laughs> Um, and as we, we grow and age, we, um, we, cats and other animals, have germ cells inside of us, and this process will begin again. And in this way, germ cells can be passed from one generation to the next indefinitely. And that is why we will say that the germline is immortal. So for those people who are very focused on searching for immortality, I would ask that they look maybe inside and instead of some of the crazy things that people do to look for immortality. Um, so in, um, I'm in the Yamashita lab over in the Whitehead, and we seek to understand the intricacies of sperm development, and we do this in the organism Drosophila melanogaster, or the simple fruit, fruit fly. And I've been in the lab for a long time, and I could go on and on and on about all these intricacies and how fascinating I think the fly testis is, and you'd probably all think that I am a little crazy by the end of that, um, but instead I'm just going to take a step back and say what drives me as a scientist, and that is that I want to see biology. I want to see it with my own eyes and with the help of a microscope, um, no matter how small it is, no matter how rare it is, no matter how transient it is, I want to be able to see it. Um, and so this image is not so much, you know, one aspect of germ cell development, but rather me sort of paying, paying homage to a model system that has kept me fascinated and arguably overworked for many, many years. <laughs> So what, what you're looking at here is actually 10 days worth of germ cell development all, at, all in one image. And development starts at the very top here and then the germ cells will mature as they move down along this spiral. So up here is the most immature cells, down here is the most mature cells. And what this does is it really gives me a storyboard really of, of, of germ cell development in the fly. Um, so I can see all the stages arrayed for me. I can tell if I mess up one stage what happens to the remaining stages without needing to take a video. It's all there right in front of me. So I want to just highlight really quickly a few of my favorite stages of germ cell development. Um, so the first would be the germline stem cells. They're located way at the tip there, and they are um, a stem cell population. And what's really cool about them is they will divide asymmetrically. So they'll divide, they'll produce one new germ, one new stem cell and one other cell that's going to go on to make sperm. And somehow these cells are able to sort components that they know this component needs to go to the stem cell and this component needs to go to that other cell. And they're able to tell what direction to push some of these cellular components. So I think that's really cool. And then my personal favorite cell type in, in the Drosophila testis are these spermatocytes. Um, so you can think of spermatocytes as that member of a group project that has to do all the work for everybody else. So maybe I can relate a little, and that's why I like them so much. <laughs> 
So what spermatocytes do is they will produce all the products that are going to be needed to actually make a sperm, including the magenta and yellow RNAs that I am showing um, in the image. And then the final type of germ cell that I want to highlight for you tonight are the mature sperm themselves. Um, so I'm showing those in cyan. Um, so I like to always talk about this and it's my favorite fun fact about, about fruit flies. Um, so we all know that fruit flies are really, really small. If you've seen them in your house, they're really small. And if you look at a fruit fly sperm and compare it to a human sperm, they both look pretty spermy. However, if you then look at the size, fruit fly sperm are two millimeters long. And in fact, fruit flies have some of the longest sperm in the animal kingdom. So the more you know. <laughs> um, and um, so with that, I just wanna thank um, my lab, especially Yukiko um, for giving me all these opportunities to explore germ cell development um, and also our funding for giving me lots of pretty fun microscopes to play with and take images with. <laughs> so. Thank you. Jackie, thank you so much. Oh, this is for you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, time flies when we're learning fun facts. <laughs> All right. Um, actually, and I really like this idea of, um, of the immortal cell line. Oh, dear. I think we are standing too close. All right. Yes. No, I really like the idea of the immortal cell line because it gives a lot of um, as a theater kid, it gives a lot of power to one of those classic 80s musicals of fame, right? I'm gonna live forever. I'm gonna learn how to drosophilia. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna stick with that. We're gonna stick with the flies and the model systems, but we're gonna come out and talk a little bit more about the roles that cells play in overall tissue development. So Marianne uh, is gonna come and talk to us for America's next top remodel organism. Thank you, Erica. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Mary Ann Collins, and I work in Martin Lab over in Building 68. And oops, there we go. Uh, in the Martin Lab, we're interested in the process of morphogenesis, or more simply put, how developing tissues form their shape. Now, you can think of this process as analogous to the art of paper folding, known as origami, which transforms a flat sheet of paper into different shapes through a series of precise folds. And much like origami, living tissues deform and undergo these massive transformations that will shape the developing embryo from a simple collection of cells into a complex three-dimensional organism. And depending on how that tissue is folded, can give rise to many diverse body plans of various shapes and sizes. Now, much of what we know about the mechanisms that drive tissue morphogenesis and these massive tissue deformations has been, done, um, has been done in studies using the fruit fly Drosophila melanogaster. And by combining the classic Drosophila genetic toolkit along with advanced imaging techniques, we can use the Drosophila embryo to watch life fold before our eyes. Just over the course of a few hours, this embryo will undergo dynamic, oops, there we go, thank you. This embryo will undergo dynamic trans transformation through a series of folds which will transform the embryo from a pseudo flat tissue sheet into multiple layers. In the Martin lab though, we are interested in understanding the formation of the first fold to form, which is known as the ventral fold. And this involves the inward movement of a subset of cells along the bottom, along the bottom, uh, there we go, along the bottom edge of the embryo shown here. So, um, so tissue movements like this and others that occur are driven by mechanical forces that are generated by each individual cell within the tissue, but then must work together to collectively bend and ultimately change the morphology of the embryo. So to understand the impact that these mechanical forces have on cellular behavior, I take images of embryos at different stages of development and then track how cells change their shape and organization within the tissue during the folding process. So shown here, each cell is uh, labeled here by its nucleus shown in gray, and they are physically linked one to one another by these cellular junctions shown here in orange. Now using this junctional signal, 
I can then trace and segment out each individual cell within the image in order to track how they change as the tissue evolves. So if we look at this first pair of images here, prior to tissue folding, cells within the entire tissue sheet have similar morphology. Yet as the tissue begins to fold, we now see these cells take on new shape, with those in the center now constricting and shrinking in size, while those at the outer edge begin to stretch. And as this tissue continues to fold inward, those stretched cells that were once on opposite ends of the tissue now come together and form new contact, resulting in a newly formed ventral fold down the middle of the embryo. Now, by using this comparative view, we can really see tissue origami in action. The left side of the image shows this newly formed ventral furrow that forms, illustrating that the new tissue is adapting and transforming into a new morphology. The segmentation on the right allows me to track these different cellular behaviors and observe how cellular mechanics can contribute to the overall reshaping of that tissue. Together, they paint a dynamic picture of an organism truly undergoing a re massive remodeling event to help the developing embryo take on its new form. And with that, I'd first, I'd first and foremost like to thank the organizers of the Koch Image Awards, uh, namely Erica and the panel of judges for selecting my image and giving me this incredible opportunity to share with you all a glimpse of my work. Uh, I would also like to thank my advisor, Adam Martin, the larger fly community for developing and sharing all these wonderful resources with us as well as the NIH for funding our research. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. I really think this research has a real pull to it. Um, so thank you for showing us uh, how, how research can take the form of a beautiful image. All right, we're gonna continue our theme of looking at cells to find out what's going on in a larger system. Uh, and we're going to Move on here for a rousing game of Capture the Flags. Thanks, Erica. Hello, everyone. My name is Sasan. I'm a postdoc at uh, Paolo Hammond Lab and Daryl Irvin, uh, Irvin Lab at the Koch Institute. Today, I'd like to talk about some immunology aspects of human body. Um, so our tissues in the body, such as the skin, has immune cells. Um, that reside there and pass through, and these are very important for monitoring different diseases. However, when you go to the clinic, they often get blood draws from you or get a little bit of biopsy from your tissue. Oftentimes, for some diseases, you can, the clinicians cannot detect the markers that are responsible for, for example, autoimmune diseases or some infectious diseases and even cancer within this uh, regular immunophenotyping. For analyzing the tissue, such as the skin, there are gold standards in the clinic. One method is called suction blister. What happens is that there is a cup that attached to the skin and by applying the vacuum, uh, it can appear some blisters on the skin. Here's a heads up for the blisters image. And then you can remove the blisters liquid and get information about the biomarkers and immune cells from the area. However, the, this has some drawbacks. One is that this pressure induced the rise in the temperature, which is detrimental for some cytokines and biomarkers that resist in our tissue. And also you cannot use these approaches on uh, fragile skins like in the older population and also on infants. And also talking to clinician, children don't like this. So we devised a method called a microneedle skin patches that can go to the skin. It has tiny projections. It doesn't induce any pain or redness. And it can sample immune cells and um, cytokines from the skin similar to the golden standards in the clinic. Now let's look at these micro -indels. They are in the, uh, about one to two square centimeter in size. Think of them as a smart band-aid. So you apply them to the skin. These tiny projections are about 500 micrometer, less than a millimeter. It goes to your skin. And by going to the skin, the hydrogen that we coated these micro -indels with swells. And by swelling, it can bring the immune cells and cytokines to the, to the micro -indel patch. Later on, we remove the patch. We wash it and look at the cells. This way, we can get an information 
about the status of different diseases through skin tissues. We have validated our method to, uh, by analyzing this on animal models. We vaccinate the mice, do the boost, and do a skin challenge where we can induce some artificial inflammation on their skin to see how we can capture these cells. By applying these patches, we can get a, a profile of their changing of different biomarkers in their skin. We can go from day one to day seven and on, ongoing. Analyze, for example, how these inflammatory biomarkers change over time. This is particularly important. Many of the available methods in the clinic, you cannot sample one patient every day or let's say hours. There are like harsh biopsies and patients are not willing to participate. But, but this method is non-invasive and you can sample patient over time. In parallel, we can also get information about immune cells. These purple colored stops on the tines of needles shows the immune cells that gather into the microindel patch. But let's take a, have a closer look to these cells. So um, the false colored these, uh, cells, these are immune cells based on the morphology that they have. Um, and if we take a look at, uh, take a closer look at them, this morphology is kind of telling us that these are most likely lymphocytes, although we do secondary approaches, more uh, quantitative approaches such as flow cytometry and single cell sequencing to get a real nature of, this, of these cells. But generally this image shows how these immune cells over time crawl into this smart band-aids and give us information about the background of the disease and response to the therapeutics and vaccine. Uh, we successfully got RB approval to test these patches on human patients. We have uh, different cohorts of patients. So as you can see here, these patches can apply on the skin with a, with a mild pressure, and it doesn't induce much redness or inflammation on this skin after application. Uh, we, are, we, are have, we have a cohort of patients with autoimmune skin diseases, such as vitiligo, psoriasis, dermatitis, here in Massachusetts that we use these patches for monitoring them over time. One really particular important thing is that, for example, if you look at this allergic reaction on the skin, over time, we can monitor one patient and see how they, the immune cells and biomarkers change in the, uh, in the skin over time. This is particularly important because, for example, when a patient with autoimmune disease go to the clinic, they often prescribe steroids or drugs that uh, clinicians have to wait for months to get a result. This way we can apply or prescribe therapeutics, test it and get a quicker turnaround of the, the effectiveness of this drug. And also you can predict the onset flare up and remission of these autoimmune diseases. We have also have an RB approval to test, test these patches on the uh, women with ovarian cancer. So they wear these patches around the abdomen and based on the changes of the biomarkers, we can get an idea about the progression of the disease, the onset of the disease and the response to the uh, therapeutics. With that, I would like to acknowledge uh, the people who helped me, especially uh, my superstar technician, Ryan, who is here sitting here and my uh, MSRP summer intern, and of course, Paolo and Daryl and all the people in Hammond and Irvine Lab who helped me and without them, it was impossible. Um, very thankful to the nanotechnology material Cole, Abigail, David, and Peggy. Uh, they helped me a lot with the imaging and a big shout out to Erica for everything from the submission of these images to, this, to today with all the organization. And of course the funding, especially the bridge project for our ovarian cancer project. Thank you so much for that. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you. Yeah, there are a lot of people out there saying, this is my site, a kind of project. All right, and I will tell it, I'll let you all know that if anyone out there, if you uh, need a little more information about this, uh, you can definitely catch all the presenters at the reception afterwards about any of these projects. All right, so Sasan brought up immune cells, which is what's gonna bring us uh, into our next, next image of microparticles meeting immune cells. So this is uh, Will Rothwell with Shell Game. All right. So I imagine a lot of you guys know that vaccines often require multiple doses to be effective. 
And these doses are usually given at a healthcare facility of some kind by trained personnel, requiring multiple visits to complete a vaccine series. Well, what if you could give a single shot of the vaccine and that shot contain all the components necessary for the first and subsequent doses? And wouldn't that be especially great for places on earth that are remote and have scarce access for resources to administer vaccines in the first place? Well, Energy Clinic and Bob Langer's group have been working on such technology for several years. And my image is a slice of that technology. So let me tell you how it works. To make a single injection self-boosting vaccine, they use micromolded core shell particles. These particles are hundreds of microns in size and are made of a biodegradable, biocompatible polymer shell on the outside containing a core that's filled with vaccine. The shell is made of two parts, a base and a cap. The base holds the core that's filled and the cap is sealed on top. On the image on the left, below the red and the blue, you can see one of these particles finished, ready to go into the body. In a wet environment, you can see on the next image that the cap uh, degrades and deforms first, the base will degrade later. And on the right, you can see a micro CT image, an X-ray slice of what one of these particles looks like. And you can see pores that are forming in the cap. And it's through these pores that the contents of the particle will escape in a burst. And that burst is timed to occur at a specific time point after administration of the particle. Now you can develop several populations of these particles so that each population breaks down and releases its contents at a different time point. That's what the red, green, and blue cubes represent on the graph. If you mix these together and inject them into an individual, they'll break down at different time points and you'll get, you'll get vaccine doses released in pulses. And these pulses can be timed to a vaccine administration schedule. Now, whenever you inject anything into the body, the body senses that and mounts a foreign body response. This is coordinated by proteins binding to the surface of the object, immune cells coming in, like neutrophils, monocytes, and macrophages, and finally fibroblasts coming in to wall off the object. The question was asked, what does the foreign body response look like for these particles, and does it affect cargo release? And my image was from one of the first experiments that was done to answer these questions. Let me tell you about that experiment. Empty core shell particles were injected under the skin of mice, biopsied, frozen, and sliced like you would slice a slice of bread. I then used a dye to highlight immune cells that were part of the foreign body response, monocytes and macrophages, and then took photographs using a confocal microscope. I compiled those photographs into the image as well as the 3D rendering of the slice of the particle. In red, you can see the walls, and the base of the particle. In blue, the biodegrading cap. And in green, you can see the immune cells that made it inside the particle at this time point. Now, normally you would see immune cells on the outside as well. But when I was doing the dyeing procedure, the slice fell out of the skin section and I took the photograph anyway. But if you look really closely on the top left-hand side here, you can see that there are a couple of little straggler cells that hung on for dear life and still made it into the photo. Going forward, understanding how the body interacts with these particles will ensure that they're able to deliver their cargo most effectively to folks around the world who need access to this type of technology. And it bears saying that you can not only deliver vaccines using this technology, but also things like drugs and chemotherapy. I'd like to thank PI's Anna Clinic and Bob Langer, uh, Morteza and Maria for their help with the experiments, John for his advice, Charlene and Kathy and the uh, histology core and Jeff Wyckoff in the microscopy core, as well as funders. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I think we all give this one the seal of approval. Yeah. All right. And I, I have to say the, the multi-dose uh, boosting is really a real selling point. All right. So we're going to continue on the thread of the microparticles and the, the seal stamped and delivered method. Uh, Rhoda and Julie are going to come tell us about a second generation version uh, of some of this technology. So welcome to Polymer Rising. The wrong subtitle. This is supposed to be at the wrong subtitle. This is supposed to be 
This is a this is a shining hope for vac global vaccine equity. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Rhoda, and this is Julie. And uh, as Erica introduced, we are also from the Linger Lab Jackman Group. And it is our pleasure to introduce you to our second generation of the Kosha Mega Particles. So mRNA vaccine is a new type of vaccine uh, using a copy of genetic material from a virus to trigger in the response in the body. And specifically, the piece of genetic material from the targeted virus would be delivered into the body where proteins that can activate the immune response will be produced accordingly. And in 2020, as probably everyone here already knows, uh, when the COVID-19 MRA vaccines were developed in record time and authorized for emergency use, this new type of vaccine got a lot of attention from both scientific researchers and the general public. So when we talk about MRA vaccines, we also need to talk about weak nanoparticles, or LMP. So when the MRA is injected into the body, it can be easily destroyed and therefore cannot be used to translate into proteins. And this makes sense because our body is designed to protect us from foreign genetic, uh, genetic materials. And here comes in the weak nanoparticles, which can be considered as a vehicle composed of fatty molecules. And this lipid can encapsulate MRA protecting it from degradation and assisting the delivery of MRA into cells. So now, as we all know, the mRNA LMP technology is awesome, but we want to be able to provide this great technology to everyone. Um, vaccine equity is when everybody has fair and just access to vaccination, and there are many social, geographic, political, economic, and environmental factors that create challenges for this vaccination access and acceptance, and they often affect racial and ethnic minority groups. The two biggest factors accounting for the vaccine inequity are missed opportunity for vaccination, which refers to any contact with healthcare uh, provider by an individual who is eligible for vaccination, but ends up not receiving the vaccine dose. And the need for cold chain as uh, vaccines must be transported and stored at a negative temperature to maintain their stability and potency. So as an approach towards vaccine equity, we are using stamped assembly of polymer layers or the seal technology, which allows administration of multiple doses with a single injection. For a vaccine type that requires multiple doses, uh, multiple booster shots like COVID vaccine, you have to follow up and get booster shots uh, weeks or months after. And that poses a risk of under vaccination or incomplete immunization. So here with the core shell seal technology, we encapsulate vaccines in the core and engineer the, seal, uh, the shell material to degrade at different time points um, so that uh, the cargo can be released at different uh, time points as needed. This way we can inject all vaccine doses with one shot and uh, reduce the risk of mis uh, missed doses. Yeah, so um, in our project, we find that when a layer of polymer coating was applied at the bottom of the seal microparticle, a significant improvement of LMP stability could be, could be achieved. And fascinated by this improvement, we studied the coating using microscope imaging. And here we observed that the polymer coating, as you can see here in the pink color, maintained as a layer between the steel particle base and the mRNA LMP, shown here in the blue color. And we hypothesized that such a coating could work as a shield to further protect and stabilize mRNA LMP. And now we are in progress to further explore this platform for mRNA vaccine delivery and um, hopefully to contribute to improve vaccine equity uh, globally in the future. And finally, we want to, again, thank Anna and Bob for their mentorship and also our Jacqueline group uh, for wonderful support and help. Um, we also want to thank our Europe's, uh, Sinia and Laboni, who really helped us with this project and particle fabrication. Thank you, everyone.
So we have your here. So all right, thank you. I think between between these we can we've all back seen the, the impact that this kind of work can have. Yes. I know. I'm sorry. I will try to contain myself, but it's it's really good advice as well, right? If you don't want to get cold chain, put a coating on it. All right. Um, so we're going to move uh, a little bit back towards cancer now, uh, and we're going to take a look at another uh, therapeutic approach uh, for fighting disease and making things more accessible. So Daniel's going to tell us something, and he's going to, unlike me, he's going to get more to the point. Thank you, Erica, for that pun introduction. <laughs> So um, my name is Dan Schmitz. I'm a, uh, a researcher and a postdoctoral fellow in Matt van der Heiden's lab here at the Koch Institute. And as some of you know, I split my time between the laboratory and the clinic, where I specialize in the treatment of prostate cancer with radiotherapy. Uh, so my uh, interest in, uh, as a physician scientist is in really understanding the molecular me mechanisms of cancer and being able to translate the findings that we discover in the laboratory to the clinic. So radiotherapy has been around for more than 50 years. Uh, unlike surgery, radiotherapy is non-invasive. And so we use it when we need to treat cancers that are in tricky locations uh, or in patients that are not good surgical candidates. Uh, we'll also use radiotherapy when we need to treat um, uh, cancers after surgery. So when you're worried about cancer cells being left behind, radiation can be used to sterilize the surgical bed of any cancer remnants that have been left behind. So shown in the image um, is, uh, there was the colorectum, sorry, I'm gonna go back to that. Uh, this is the colorectum of a mouse that's been treated with a focal targeted beam of gamma radiation. And here we use molecular imaging to show that the targeted radiation beam only affects DNA in the nucleus of cells that are within the targeted region, shown here by the pink cells, the pink nuclei, and doesn't affect the nuclei of cells that are outside of the radiation beam. And so this is really a beautiful example of how we can target radiation and, and focally damage DNA um, uh, with, uh, with high energy radiation uh, beam. So this experiment was done as a part of a series of studies uh, that examined how to best model uh, therapeutic radiation in mice. Shown here is a top and a side view of a radiation beam uh, targeting the prostate, uh, prostate cancer in a mouse. Uh, the prostate cancer lies right here, and the colorectum that you saw in that previous image lies right behind the prostate. Uh, so we use the mouse as a model system because it allows us to examine how cancer treatment affects not only the tumor cells, but also normal tissues that surround the tumor. Uh, this is particularly important when we consider potentially curative therapy uh, because side effects caused by damage to normal tissues can frequently limit the efficacy of treatment. Ionizing radiation, as was used in this study, uh, is a very powerful treatment that at the right dose can kill virtually any cancer cell. However, however radiation has some downsides. One issue is that it has to pass through normal tissues to get to the tumor, and by doing so can injure these tissues. So herein lies the challenge. How do how can we use radiation to destroy tumor cells and yet leave non-tumor cells intact? We believe that the answer is in combining radiation with molecular targeted therapies. These are small molecule drugs that are designed to bind to specific targets in cancer cells uh, and thereby affect their growth. The problem is that they can also bind to related targets in normal cells and thereby can themselves induce side effects and toxicity. Moreover, cancer cells are smart. They can learn how to downregulate the target, resulting in acquired resistance. However, we believe if we combine molecular targeted therapy with spatially targeted radiation, we can have a chance of completely eradicating tumors and at the same time minimize toxicity. So going forward, we're very excited to leverage our preclinical platform to test combination therapies, uh, at which we hope will lead to more effective treatments with less side effects. 
So with that, I'd like to thank, uh, I'd like to acknowledge the people uh, involved in the work. Uh, I'd like to thank, of course, Dr. Vanderheiden, whose laboratory this uh, research was done in, uh, my partner in crime, Iva uh, Germanica, who's here today, uh, and I'm sure is happy to answer any questions uh, at, the, at, uh, at the reception afterwards. Um, I'd like to also uh, thank a diverse group of radiation oncologists, radiation biologists, medical physicists, who are all involved in helping to develop a platform uh, that was used to, to generate the image that I showed you today. Uh, I'd like to also acknowledge uh, folks from the cores here at, at the KI, uh, both in the histology core and the imaging core facility who helped uh, in the development of the platform. Thank you very much. Thank you. That really hit the spot. Thank you. Um, I like this because it uh, very much shows how lots of people and ideas can work together uh, to make progress in a lot of wonderful health areas. Um, and Dan has kind of brought us into the final theme of the evening, which is um, models and what we can learn about them and how we can integrate that with what's happening in the clinic. So our last two presentations uh, will we'll do this, beginning with um, Catherine. Let's just grow with it, shall we? Okay, can everyone hear me okay? Awesome. Thank you, Erica, for the introduction, and thank you, everyone, for being here this evening. Um, I'm Catherine Sabula, a member of the Boehm Lab, and this evening, I'm really excited to share with you our work is doing, our lab is doing work with partnering with patients with rare cancers, creating models from that, and doing our own work on those models, but also sharing it with other researchers. So why are we interested in using um, cells from cancers and creating models from them. Well, using the tumor directly can actually limit the amount of studies we can do. But if we take that tumor and digest it and create a cell model from it, that can increase the amount of studies and allows us to do more with them. And overall, cancer cell models have become an essential tool in cancer research as they allow us to learn more about cancer biology, find new and different therapeutics, and overall improve patient outcomes. So how does creating a cancer cell model work? Well, first, one's lab or the patient will connect and figure out what they want to do with their cancer. And then from there, those patients will donate a part of their sample to a lab. And then the lab will take that sample, digest it, and isolate those cells into a dish and grow it out with nutrient-rich media or other growth supplements and keep growing those cells until we have an established cell line. And from there, we can use that cell model for other screens. Now, our lab focuses on rare and understudied cancers. And with that comes some challenges. The first challenge being that there are limited samples. Either because we're working with rare cancers, there's samples limited, donated locally, or because of this bureaucracy set up behind sample collection that can really inhibit the patient from donating their sample for research. So to tackle this first challenge, our lab has been working with Pattern, a patient collaboration provider. Um, while working with institutions can be great, it can limit who you reach out to. And there's this bureaucracy behind, or it could be a long workflow or a long time and long setup of setting a successful workflow between connecting the doctor with the patient to the patient to the researchers. So pattern really now gives this power to the patient to decide if and where they would like their sample to go for research. Oh, sorry about that. And we've been partnering with pattern for the past several years now. And through this form of patient engagement, we've really been able to allow to take in more square samples and use them to help create more cell models. And so this, while we have samples in the lab now, this leads us to our second challenge, where we have to tackle this paradox of while cancer cells can grow uncontrollably inside of a body, outside in a dish, it's another story. And with the rare and underrepresented cancers we work with, it's not so much cells are, aren't growing, it's the wrong population of cells that are growing, meaning those healthy cells are out competing the tumor cells we want to grow into that cell model. And this is because we don't have that secret formula that grows out those tumor cells. 
meaning there's no really good recipe or growth factors out there that can help these cells out, those cancer cells outcompete those healthy cells. So to address this challenge, our lab has come up with this high throughput workflow to grow those cells out in multiple media conditions. And to go through this workflow, I'll tell you about one of the samples we work in the lab with are desmoid tumors, which are a rare form of sarcoma. And so we receive a patient sample. We take that sample and digest it into cells. And we plate those cells into a well plate and grow them out in our media matrix. And as you can imagine, those medias are gonna have different effects on the cells. Some going to increase growth for the tumor and some for the wild type cells. So we can't observe cell growth with our naked eye. So we need to use the help of um, microscopy as observed in this image here, but even better observed in the following image. Here we can now observe the successful growth of the tumor cells we grow out in our media matrix um, from one of the media conditions we've used. And now zooming back out, here we can now appreciate and observe the successful growth based on the abundance of cells and by the successful swirling growth pattern with each swirl starting from a single cell that has grown out into many. And overall, this image really represents all of the hard work our lab has put into creating a model for this rare cancer, from working with patients and collecting their sample, to getting it into our lab, growing it out in our media matrix, and then using microscopy to help observe growth over time. And with that, I would like to thank my lab, the Bowen Lab, for giving me this opportunity to present and all of the mentorship they have provided me, um, the pattern team for really connecting us with patients and remembering where all of this work and all of this is helping, and then the CCLF team at the Broad for a lot of this work has originated from, other screening collaborators we work with, and a big thank you to all the patients who have donated their tissues for our research so far. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. I think we can all agree for, for some rare research, this is very well done and very high stakes. All right, we've got one more presentation of the evening also in the vein of uh, making models. Uh, William Huang is gonna talk to us and his presentation, I gotta tell you, it takes nerve. I'm very honored to be here tonight representing the JAX lab where I did my postdoctoral research as well as my very new uh, independent lab at Mass General Harvard Medical School. And I wanna give a big shout out to Jennifer Sue, a research technician working with me, as well as Thomas Diefenbach, uh, director of the MGH Raygun uh, core facility for imaging, uh, for helping to generate this gallery image you see here. So many years ago when I was a medical student, I was taking care of an elderly patient with pancreatic cancer that was suffering from intractable pain. And I went down to the pathology department in search of answer for answers. And I met Dr. Mari Mino, who patiently took me through all of this patient's tissue sections, including this one shown here. And that was the first time I learned about this concept of perineural invasion. Whereas you can see here, these malignant cancer glands are surrounding and even invading into this nerve in the middle. And this image was really seared into my memory as a manifestation, a representation of my, my patient's pain. And I remember thinking, why would cancer cells form such intimate interactions with these nerves? What do they derive from this relationship and how could we intervene upon it? So I, I had to complete my medical training. So I filed this in the back of my mind. And many years later, uh, when I was back in the laboratory in Tyler Jackson's lab, I revisited this question. And I was surprised to find that at least as early as the late 1800s, uh, clinicians were looking into this. A urologist by the name of Dr. Hugh Young made a very prescient observation. He saw there was abundant nerves in many different types of peripheral tumors. And he asked, are these nerves just innocent bystanders witnessing a malignant process happening around them? Or perhaps do they play a more important role in the tumor development itself? For the next century, uh, the focus of cancer biology was really on other cells, the immune cells, the fibroblasts, the cancer cells themselves. And it wasn't until the early 2000s that Dr. Gustavo Ayala and some of his colleagues did a set of 
seminal experiments, really starting to reveal for the first time this remarkable attraction between cancer cells and nerves. And this really kicked off the field that we now call cancer neuroscience, which is still really in its infancy, where we examine the when, the how, and the why cancer cells are influenced by nerve signals and vice versa. So my team and I look into this a little bit more, and we found that not only were cancer nerve interactions implicated in neuropathic pain, as with my patient, but they also seem to play an important role in many other aspects of cancer biology, including growth, resistance to metabolic stress and therapy, immune remodeling, metastasis, as well as seizures. So it became very apparent to us that if we could intervene upon these deleterious interactions, we could make a huge difference in our patient's survival and quality of life. But there was so much unknown about the mechanisms of these interactions that we really needed to start from ground zero. So I reconnected with Dr. Mari Mino uh, and also Kathy Cormier here in the, uh, the histology core. And over a year, we painstakingly put together 288 of these patient derived cores. So these are patients with pancreatic cancer. We found matched regions with and without nerve involvement, and we put them on these grids. And we performed a technique called digital spatial profiling. And we were able to identify a set of cancer cell related genes that were associated with nerve involvement in our human tumors. But what we really wanted to know was which of these genes, if any, were actually recruiting nerves to the tumor. And then once they were there, having this dialogue with them that was clearly beneficial for the tumor and then ultimately perhaps even invading into them. And to answer those questions, we needed to be able to turn up and down any of these genes of interest. We clearly couldn't do that in our patients, so we turned to developing a new model system. And one of those model systems is what you're seeing here. So in, three dimension, in a three-dimensional tissue matrix that mimics the tumor microenvironment, we grew these genetically engineered cancer cells in the form of these tumoroids, these green uh, balls, structures that you see here. And we were able to grow them with various neurons that you see in orange on the left image and the, the pink on the right image. And by creating this model system, we could now link any of these genes that we discovered in our patients with cancer nerve interactions in a quantifiable way. We were also very interested in looking at dynamics. Uh, so uh, one of the postdocs working with me, Peter, generated this really nice video here. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Erica. Perfect. So what you're seeing here, again, this is a 3D model, and those orange balls, those are those cancer tumoroids, and they're migrating at different speeds towards what's in the middle is a ganglia, which is a collection of nerve cell bodies. And again, we're able to now measure the dynamics. And when you want to look at this in high resolution, we took a confocal image. The color's a little different. Uh, it's red here, but you can see these balls of cancer cells migrating along these purple nerve fibers towards this ganglia that was in the middle that we plucked out and imaged separately. And you can see from the red all over the ganglia that many of these cancer cells in our model system were able to invade into that nerve. So this, among some other model systems that we built, really gives us a chance to actually quantify and measure the effects of these various genes uh, on cancer nerve interaction. Oops, sorry, too fast there. Um, all right, so by starting from our patients and looking at which cancer cell genes were truly linked and associated and therefore clinically relevant in terms of tumor nerve interactions. We then moved into mechanistic investigation in these novel model systems so we could actually functionally find out how these genes were facilitating cancer nerve dialogue. Now we're able to go back to that question that I asked back when I was a medical student, what can we do about it? So we're very excited. We have some candidates that we're, we're further validating and ultimately we wanna develop new therapies that can actually block tumors abilities to hijack the nervous system for their twisted agenda. So everything I showed you today was a massive team effort. I'm very thankful to all my colleagues and lab members uh, for all their support and, and great work on this. In particular, I mentioned Jennifer and Thomas already, Jimmy, Nicole, Karina, uh, Dennis, Ishmael, Hannah, and Peter shown here, as well as many of the members of the Jack Lab. I'm very grateful to patients and their families um, for donating their time and tissues to our research, as well as all of our sponsors for believing in our work. And last but certainly not least, I'm very grateful that my family could be here tonight. And thank you everyone for sticking around to the, to the very end. Appreciate it. Thank you, William. All right. Um, so I hope you've enjoyed our journey from cells to systems to technology to models and back to cells again. 
Um, it has been a true pleasure being a part of the Image Awards. I'll tell you the Image Awards were why I applied for this job in the very first place. And I have so enjoyed getting to know this group of research and all the research over the years. Um, again, I wanna make sure that we thank our sponsors for this wonderful event. Uh, I want to encourage you all to please come to future events at the Koch Institute. We have some wonderful things planned. Um, and then of course, don't forget to vote in our People's Choice Award. I'll leave this up for people to see, but we also have a reception outside um, with some refreshments, some light dessert, uh, drinks, beverages. Um, so thank you for being here and have a wonderful night.